Hello and welcome to the For We Are Many podcast. Um, I'm pretty excited about what we have going on today. Obviously, as you see on your screen, we have a guest or he has a guest. However, we want to look at this today. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, um, we actually have published some of your previous work uh, on our website trying to help you promote it. The uh, Conquest of Red. Right, right. Yep. Which I, I still haven't finished that, but I'm still picking away at it. Um, and I, I'm just glad that other people out there are also working on theory. Because, like, when I first got into, you know, really got into leftist politics, like, there, there wasn't much information out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. It's, it's, it's echoing, echoing in, my in my ears. I don't know. I don't know. Where that doesn't come from. Me either. Hold on. Is it still? Is it still doing it? It, it, it only does when I, when I speak. Oh, that's weird. Um, let me play with my audio settings here. Yeah, that's really weird. I only got it coming through my headphones. And I, my microphone's not turned up that loud either. No, it doesn't, no, it doesn't for, you for, for you at all. It's, 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 just, it's me. just me. Huh. I don't know what, I, what I've done. <laughs> learning curve, ladies and gentlemen. Learning curve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Oh, well, I see we have at least one viewer. Let's see if that, see if that happens. No, no. It didn't, didn't. How about, How about now? now? No, no. Keep second. Keep second. Huh, I wonder what's going on there. I don't seem to be having any issues. Um, are your settings like... You got, I mean, I would assume you have the sound coming through your headphones, right? Yeah, yeah I, I have both the, both audio, the audio input, input and, and the output. Huh. I'm on my microphone. Uh, well, anyway, while well, we get this figured out, um, yeah, yeah. We, had, we brought guest, or, <laughs> damn it, take two, we brought <laughs> Red Theory on as a guest because we wanted to do this uh, cross-pollination efforts, uh, and, and we've kind of talked a little bit about how, like, you know, Trisha and I, who hopefully will be here shortly, but Trisha and I kind of have a hard time looking at anarchist texts objectively sometimes it's not that we like you know do that intentionally but you know personally leaning more communist it's very easy to like just look at it through that lens and oh, sure. um you had mentioned that you weren't exactly comfortable at first doing um you know communist literature for the same reasons so absolutely yeah i, I think it would be uh, good for both of us to like get the other the other the other side the uh, what the hell am I trying to say? <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, to get that that perspective from someone that that is coming from it, you know, more primed to to accept uh, something that maybe you're not. So yeah, I think that that definitely is helpful. You get to see things from uh, a way that that someone who actually believes it sees it. Um, yeah, I think that's definitely helpful. Agreed. Uh, um, anyway, the, the point is that today we are going to do part one in what's going to be a series, of course, just like our other uh, book club pieces. We can't read a book in an hour, an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. um, so part one of Anarchism and Other Essays by Emma Goldman. Uh, it fell right in line with the Emma Goldman biographical piece we did a couple weeks ago. 
Oh, nice. So it, it just made sense to continue, <laughs> you know, on that path and um, not not only read about her life, but read about her work as well. Yeah. Yeah, get, get her contribution to uh, the body of theory in there as well. Right. And definitely important. Yeah, no, she's she's one that I haven't really explored myself too much yet. So I'm I'm really excited to to dive into this text as well. Um see how it relates to the other anarchist theory that I've read. So yeah, really excited. Hell yeah. I just posted the link to the PDF that I'm using because I don't have a hard copy of this book uh, into the comments on our channels, at least. Okay. Um, oh, hey, Trisha finally made it. Hell yeah. Oh. Thank God. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, whoa, what? Oh no. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Zach, I, I was just going to say, um, obviously you have your own podcast and your own, uh, YouTube channel and all that. Uh, if you wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, like who you are, what you're trying to do. Uh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Zach Ellsworth. Uh, I go by the, the name bread underscore theory on Twitch. And I do a weekly theory stream on, on Friday nights, usually around uh, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I usually take just a chapter a week of a theory audiobook. Um, actually, this week I'm going to start doing uh, a reading myself. I'm going to be starting uh, State and Revolution tonight uh, by Lenin, one of the classic communist texts. Um, and so then every Friday I do a theory and I tend to alternate back and forth between anarchist theory and communist theory just to get a, a broader perspective of uh, leftist thinkers and, and, and ideas. Um, and then on Sundays I, I do another stream and I uh, do kind of whatever. So recently I've been talking about permaculture a lot. I, I really want to bring in permaculture ideas um, as well as new urbanist ideas. Uh, those two schools of thought into leftist theory, because I think they all have something to contribute to one another. I'm trying to synthesize it into to one overall theory, which which I call solaris. And it's a, it's a word that means of the sun. And I use that as kind of a metaphor, because the sun, you know, literally connects us all. We're, we're made of stars, as, as the, the songs go. Um, all the energy that we use to create these civilizations and communicate with one another, I basically live our daily lives, all comes from, at one point or another, um, the sun or other stars. So so I I find that, that interconnectedness is at the, the heart of leftist theory, as well as permaculture and new urbanism. Permaculture is about creating sustainable, um, basically having a, a person be a part of an ecosystem and, and help co-create it rather than just you know, giving an input into the land and, and taking out whatever product you have, you're, you're co-creating with the local habitats to create more of a, a facsimile of an ecosystem that at the same time helps you and a bunch of other creatures at the same time. And then new urbanism is, is a city planning philosophy that basically is just about creating more healthy, interconnected communities, you know, whether that's through things like better mass transit or biking and walking. Um, or things like uh, having mixed-use development, so you don't segregate your commercial, your residential from one another. You mix them all together, so it reduces the amount of car trips you need to take and the amount of car infrastructure you need to have and brings the community together. So, yeah, at the heart of all these things, I, I feel, is interconnectedness. So that's what I tried to do on my channel. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a real interesting journey so far. Um, I've learned a lot through this. I can only imagine. How long have you been doing it? I've been doing it since, I think, January, February of this year. So so not that, too long. That's what I thought. That's about the same time that we started, yeah. actually. Oh, that's cool. Um, our first, okay, so we were talking about doing it before this, but our first live stream, which is what started our weekly current event streams, was the storming of the Capitol on the 6th of January. 
like oh, our first okay. ever broadcast was during that. <laughs> Man, that's one hell of a catalyst to, to get you going. Yeah. Well, okay. So like we had this group chat and we had about five people in it. We're just like, dude, dude, do you see what's going on right now? And then we like, <laughs> we're on a group like Facebook call, like all watching the news broadcast together. And we're like, dude, like this could be it. This could be, this could be what we do. And that's what kicked it off. Yeah. Wow. That's really cool. Mostly, you know, talking shit about fascists trying to seize control. <laughs> oh, and, and as fascists always do, doing it really ineptly, <laughs> having a, a lot of, you know, bravado and then just falling flat on your face the minute you try yeah. to do something. <laughs> and, and dude, I mean, that, that situation is still unfolding at the federal level and it almost cracks me up. Like, you know, the people are testifying that it wasn't pre planned, it was totally spontaneous, and the Department of Justice is buying it when they had merch. They had T-shirts made. Right. Yeah. They had like, intricate maps of the Capitol online for people to, to peruse and stuff. Like, you know, in, in a certain sense, they did know what they were doing and they planned it. They just didn't do very good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They planned it, but they didn't execute it well. No, they and, then, and then like Trump saying, you're all very special and we love you very much. Oh, I'm like, what the fuck? Well, and... and Giuliani at that at that same rally saying let's have trial by combat like I mean how explicit do you have to be right it was pretty clear what they were about to go do so <laughs> yeah 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 and remember that these people have guns <laughs> yeah yeah well I mean so should you to be honest yeah <laughs> this should as well uh I mean, just because they have guns doesn't mean they know how to use them well either. Is that's very true. That's very true. Point to keep in mind: a little bit of comfort if you're thinking that <laughs> it's going to be a well-organized army coming after you. Yeah. Oh God. Anyway, <laughs> um, so we're gonna like the okay. The link that I posted in the comments is to this PDF from the AnarchistLibrary.org. Yeah which is a really good source for, you know, anarchist theory, who would have thought, uh, much like the Marxist Internet Archives on the communist side of things. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah Marxist.org, great resource. Oh, my God, yeah. That's actually, um, I found a lot of stuff on there. Yeah. Like, I, I was surprised, like, how deep that, that database is. It's, it's an amazing resource. Yeah. Um, and a little bit easier to navigate, I'll admit, than, than the anarchist library. I, I have trouble myself trying to find stuff just by searching. Yeah. That. Yeah, okay. I'll agree with that. So, like, my, my method of approach with the anarchist library is if I'm looking for a specific text, I'll put in the name. I'll go to the Google or fucking DuckDuckGo or whatever. Right. And... Um, you know, type in the anarchist library in the name of the book that I'm looking for. It's just so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's the case. I wish they would uh, tweak that a little bit to make it a little user, more user friendly. But it, it, it is great wealth of information, though, too. So, yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. Um, anyway, we discussed before we went live whether we should like do this uh, biographical sketch that's in the beginning because it's kind of mm -hmm. long. And we've already done a biographical piece on Emma Goldman, but um, I, I do think that uh, it, it sets important context for like the situation that she's writing and the perspective she's writing from. Sure. Um, so that being said, uh, obviously most of our followers know at this point that we rescheduled Tuesday's current event stream for tonight. Uh, and that starts in, well, it was supposed to, st or it was supposed to start at five my time, but this is going to end at five my time more than likely. So, uh, you know, it will be a little bit late getting to our usual current event stream, um, but you know, we'll see what we can get through in this before. I, obviously, you have a stream at the same time, so we're all sure, kind of yeah. crunched for time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll just see what we can get through. I think that's a, a good way to go for sure. Agreed. Um, so there's, oh, hey, Trisha's back. I thought I heard the sound. Uh, 
Okay. Really having my, a bunch of issues. My I hear still you. Cutting it. It's it's better this time. I is it just kept blooping me out into the ether and back. So my apologies for that, everybody. My signal sucks today. Um, um, but, but I'm here, I'm here for the moment, moment at least. least. <laughs> <laughs> Right on. Well, I'm glad you could join us. We're actually literally just getting started at the uh, biographical sketch. We were kind of, you know, talking about shit. <laughs> um, so, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, basically, that we're just going to get through what we can get through. So, are we going to do, like, our usual format of, like, read a paragraph or two and then switch off? Sure, sure. Sure. Are we going to start with the intro, intro or two or one? Or one? Yeah, we're going to start with the intro. It provides important context. Oh, okay. The more it of really, it I read, really the more I was like, yeah, we got we to gotta read this. Sure. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm catching, catching an echo, echo again. again. I think, I think it, it, it has, has to, to do with, with the, the music. music. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Yep, yeah, it just went away completely. So I don't know if it's something huh. just on yeah, my end or, or what it is, but... I was hearing me and you guys echo, so thank you for uh, yeah. fixing that. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay. Much better. Interesting. You're you're cutting out really bad. Well, shit. Damn. Well, it was going so good at first. Should yeah. We just start, should, should we just start that over? <laughs> did I did so, you catch it? I didn't. I mean, I was reading along, so I knew what she was trying to say, but I didn't get most of the words. No. Yeah, that's that's what I thought too. Okay, so the quote was: "Propagandism is not, as some suppose, a trade, because nobody will follow a trade at which you may work with the industry of a slave and die with the reputation of a mendicant." The motives of any person to pursue such a profession must be different from those of trade, deeper than pride and stronger than interest. Uh, that's from J uh, George Jacob Hollyoke. Um, so, you know, now into the biographical sketch. Among the men and women prominent in the public life of America, there, but are, there are but a few whose names are mentioned as often as that of Emma Goldman. Yet the real Emma Goldman is almost quite unknown. The sensational press has surrounded her name with so much misrepresentation and slander, it would seem almost a miracle that, in spite of this web, uh, this web of calumny, the truth breaks through and a better appreciation of this much maligned idealist begins to manifest itself. There is but little consolation in the fact that almost every representative of a new idea has had to struggle and suffer under similar difficulties. Is it of any avail that a former president of a republic pays homage at Asawatami? I am sorry if I butchered that. Uh, in, to the memory of John Brown? Or that the president of another republic participates in the unveiling of a statue in honor of Pierre Proudhon and holds up his life to the French nation as a model worthy of enthusiastic emulation? Of what avail is all this when, at the same time, the living John Browns and Proudens are being crucified? The honor and glory of a Mary Wollstonecraft or of a Louise Michel are not enhanced by the city fathers of London or Paris naming a street after them. The living generation should be concerned with doing justice to the living Mary Wollstonecrafts and Louise Michels. 
Posterity assigns to men like Wendell Phillips and Lloyd Garrison the proper niche of honor in the temple of human emancipation. But it is the duty of their contemporaries to bring them due recognition and appreciation while they while they live. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't know a lot of those people, so it's hard for me to speak on them. I, I know Proudhon um, as one of the fathers of, of modern anarchy. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess basically what they're saying, though, is is uh, it's up to, to her contemporaries to really um, do her justice when they talk about her and her right. work. Right. Well, I would hope you know who John Brown is. Even well, if you yes, don't know I, I do know who John Brown is. That's true. I do know all about John Brown. Um, that is not. I mean, I wouldn't have been offended if you didn't, because we sure as shit didn't learn about him in high school. I know. Isn't that crazy that they just chose to gloss over all of that that troubling stuff? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and now they're trying even harder to to whitewash all of American history. For sure. Just ridiculous. So, yeah. Um, Hi again. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hello again. Doing that whole riding the energy waves out there and back thing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. So we are so we are really supposed to be here. Um we are at the second paragraph after the quote. Uh, the path of the propagandist of social justice is strewn with thorns. The powers of darkness and injustice exert all their might lest a ray of sunshine enter his cheerless life. Nay, even his comrades in the struggle, indeed too often his most intimate friends, show but little understanding for the personality of the pioneer. Envy, sometimes growing to hatred, vanity, and jealousy, obstruct his way and fill his heart with sadness. It requires an inflexible will and a tremendous enthusiasm not to lose under such conditions all faith in the cause. The representative of a revolutionizing, that's always been a weird word to me, revolutionizing. Revolutionizing? Rather, rather than I, I don't revolutionary. Know why. Right. Yeah. yeah. The representative of a revolutionizing idea uh, stands between two fires. On the one hand, the persecution of the existing powers which hold them responsible for all acts resulting from co uh, social conditions. And on the other, the lack of understanding on the part of his own followers who often judge all his activity from a narrow standpoint. Mm -hmm. Thus it happens that the agitator stands quite alone in the midst of the multitude uh, surrounding him. Even his most intimate friends rarely understand how solitary and deserted he feels. That is the tragedy of the person prominent in the public eye. Yeah, I would say there's a lot of truth to that, for sure. Um, as he, as he says, you have on the one side you're being uh, you're being criticized by the powers that be, because of course they are. They they want to they have it in, in a vested interest in keeping things as they are because they're doing pretty well in the current system. And on the other side, you have every sort of armchair critic of, of every social movement, you know, you could have done this better. You're not doing it right. Uh, you know, the people that are, are so quick to, to try and put a label on you, whether it's, you know, tanky or liberal or, or anarchy or whatever it may be, you know, just to, just to bring you down. Um, yeah. Which I mean, it's kind of funny. Cause like I've gotten to a point now where I'm like, yeah, I am a communist. So what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty much the same way with, with my anarchism, too. I'm just like, you know, I, instead of just squabbling about, you know, uh, what's the best form of leftism or, or you know, um, who's uh, who's legitimate and who's cringe or, or whatever it may be, rather than just, you know, 
screwing around with that, just be like, hey, this is what I believe in, and here's why. I think that's that's basically all you can do, and I hope to actually make any progress. You know, uh, we had a really good conversation. We had a really good conversation with our first guest. Guest, he was a uh, uh, an organizer with a mutual aid group in Texas when they had that okay. winter storm, and he's oh. an anarchist. And and we yeah. were kind of talking about like, well, yeah, we can bicker all day about the role of the state, but it doesn't fucking mm-hmm. matter if we can't overthrow capitalism. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that, that, that's why I'm, I myself am not so hardcore in my beliefs that I, I feel it's the only way forward. And in fact, I think probably a, a diversity of tactics in whatever we're talking about, whatever cause we're going for, I mean, it has to be the way. Just just to get enough people on your side to, to have that critical mass and, and make change. You can't be so picky and, and purist as to, to you know, discount any, anyone who doesn't precisely line up with your version of whatever leftist thought you you're coming from. Right. Um, you want to read some, Zach? Sure, yeah. I'll take the next chapter, or next uh, paragraph there. All right, let's see. So, the midst in which the name of Emma Goldman has so long been uh, enveloped in gradually beginning to dissipate, her energy in the furtherance of such an unpopular idea as anarchism, her deep earnestness, her courage and abilities, finding uh, find growing understanding and admiration. Uh, the debt American intellectual growth owes to the revolutionary exiles has never been fully appreciated. The seed uh, disseminates by disseminated by them through, uh, though so little understood at the time, has brought a rich harvest. They have at all times held aloft the banner of liberty, thus impregnating the social vitality of the nation. But very few have succeeded in persevering, uh, preserving, excuse me, their European education and culture while at the same time assimilating themselves uh, with the with American life. It is difficult for the average man to form an adequate concept uh, conception of what strength, energy, and perseverance are necessary to absorb the unfamiliar language, habits, and customs of a new country without the loss of his own personality. Okay. I almost forgot to unmute myself there. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, so that's the whole thing, is this, this entire idea of assimilation has always really bothered me since I learned about uh, the assimilation of Native American cultures in school. Like, it just didn't make sense to me. Why couldn't they just be them? You know, sure. and, and obviously at the time I didn't, I, I had no way of knowing, you know, what that actually meant. Mm -hmm. But I just did not understand, like, why can't they be themselves? And why do we expect people who come here from other places to just, you know, assimilate to begin with? Yeah. Yeah, I'd I'd say it's it's that same sort of um, preference for the status quo. You know, the fear of what might be coming over is, is getting the better of people when they want them to just all you know, speak English, be American, whatever that means to them. Um, yeah, this, this is all from the reactionary side of things, for sure. Yeah. Um, so. Um, Emma Goldman is one of the few who, while thoroughly preserving their individuality, have become an important factor in the social and in- intellectual atmosphere of America. The life she leads is rich in color, full of change and variety. She has risen to the topmost heights, and she has also tasted the bitter dregs of life. Emma Goldman was born of uh, Jewish parentage on the 27th day of June, 1869, in the Russian province of Kovno, or Kovno. I'm not good at Russian. Probably Kovno. Uh, That's what I assume. Yeah. Surely these parents never dreamed what unique position their child would someday occupy. Like all conservative parents, they too were quite convinced that their daughter would marry a respectable citizen, bear him children, 
and round out her allotted years surrounded by a flock of grandchildren, a good religious woman. <laughs> As most parents, they had no inkling what a strange, impassioned spirit would take hold of the soul of their child and carry it to the heights which separate generations in eternal struggle. They lived in a land and at a time when antagonism between parent and offspring was fated to find its most acute expression, irreconcilable hostility. In this tremendous struggle between fathers and sons, and especially between parents and daughters, there was no compromise, no weak yielding, no truth. The spirit of liberty, of progress, and idealism, which knew no considerations and recognized no obstacles, drove the young generation out of the parental house and away from the hearth of the home. Uh, just as the same spirit once drove out the revolutionary breeder of discontent, Jesus, and alienated him from his native tra uh, traditions. Yeah, so the definitely describing a very conservative household being the norm. Um, right. Even among, yeah, yeah. I guess it doesn't, yeah, I'm not sure what's going with that, but uh, yeah, so I guess I, I think all that's to say is that it was pretty remarkable that she managed to resist all of that, you know, all those calls to uh, tradition and, and uh, conservative, conservatism to uh, reach for something more, so. Yeah, yeah, um, which I mean, you know, sometimes, like, okay, look at the uh, the revolutionary attitude, I guess, in places, like, that you wouldn't expect it, like Austin, Texas. I feel mm -hmm. like, you know, repression and oppression breed revolutionary ideas. So, mm -hmm. like, you get these, like, pockets of revolutionaries in completely backwards conservative areas. And it's, right. it's really, it gives me hope. <laughs> Oh, me too. Me too. Uh, yeah, I've been thinking about that sort of thing a lot lately. And I think, well, yes, it, it does It tend to breed revolutionaries. I think at the same time, it, it just kind of depends on the way the person breaks. They might go ultra conservative as well. Um, and, you know, basically it's, it's the current situation sucks, obviously, but what are you going to do about it? So I, I guess it breaks down to are you going to try for something a whole lot better, you know, progress for everybody, or are you just going to retreat back into, you know, the arms of some imagined tradition, you know, because it's, it's, you know, usually some imagined time, like right now it's the 1950s that, that conservatives always hearken back to. And I think for a lot of dispossessed people, that's attractive, unfortunately. So I think it's, it's really important for, for all leftists to, put themselves out there as, you know, a hand that they can grab onto, these people that are, are breaking one way or the other, and pull as many of them towards our side as, as possible. Because, I mean, we have real answers for these things. Their, their answer is just go back and, and you know, it might suck for a whole big portion of people, but but hopefully not you, buddy. Um, but our answers, answers from the left are for everybody. They're, they're for the, the betterment and the upliftment of, of all of humanity. So to me, that's that's a better answer, and I think we just need to be there at that critical time to to help people over. Amen to that. All right, I'll continue on then. Oh, where were we at there? What role the Jewish race? Ah, oh, okay. Here we go. What role the Jewish race, notwithstanding all anti-Semitic. Uh, Calumny, uh, calumnies. I'm not familiar with that word. The race. Yeah, I, I I came across it a couple paragraphs ago, and I did the same thing. I'm like, Calum yeah, calumnies, anti-Semitic calumnies. <laughs> I don't know. I'll have to look that one up later. Yeah, uh, actually, hold on, hold on. Just pause for a second. And I'll sure, look it sure. Up. Cal calumny, 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 Cal Yeah. Uh, the making of false and defamatory statements about someone in order to damage their reputation. Oh, okay. slander. Okay. So it's, that makes it's, sense. That makes sense. It's, it's like the modern day people that, that push the, the J question, um, the Jewish question, 
and stuff like that. These these conspiracy theorists that for some reason, oh, the, are, like the jackasses that wear the six million wasn't enough shirts. Yes, yes, yeah, it's those kinds of people. I think that's who they're talking about. Yeah. So, so notwithstanding all the anti-Semitic calumnies, the race of transcendental idealism played in the struggle of the old and the new will probably never be appreciated with complete impartiality and clarity. Only now uh, we are beginning to perceive the tremendous debt we owe to the Jewish idealists in the realm of science, art, and literature, but very little is still known of the important part the sons and daughters of Israel have played in the revolutionary movement and especially in that of modern times. Hmm. Uh, I mean, that, that makes sense, really. Um, you know, Marx, Marx was a Jew, right? Yeah, yeah. Even though he gets, um, he tries, people try to slap that anti-Semitic label on him all the time. Yeah, I, I don't, just, I don't get that. People, okay, so like, let's not forget that the trump Republicans yeah. I don't, <laughs> fucking tried to label Bernie Sanders as a fucking anti-Semite. Of course. I mean, they, they do it with all of them. Like, uh, it's so bizarre uh, they did the same thing with Jeremy Corbyn, trying to label him as an anti-Semite. That like kind of tanked his career for a little bit there. And at the same time, they literally are the anti-Semites. They're the people that are that that in their hearts want things like ethno states for white people only. And they definitely don't consider the Jewish people white people. So it's with the exception of Israel. Yeah. Well, I mean, oh, that, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. We yeah, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I didn't mean to open that fucking wormhole there, but. Well, yeah, it's just such a bizarre tactic. It's it's like yeah. how they, they, they're so quick now to label everyone a racist because they've been called racist for so long, I guess. And But it, the thing is, when it's, they, yeah. when it comes to them, they actually are racist. You know, if you look at the things they actually want and say, yeah, they want the best for white people and then not much you know everyone else is you know left to their own devices and so yeah so don't fall for that sort of thing like like pretty much any time I, I come across a conspiracy and it gets to some sort of question of, of whether or not the Jews control this or that or the other thing then I you know that's a, that's a good signal to not really take that seriously anymore and uh, you know exactly where they're coming from and what they're they're trying to push Absolutely. So, uh, do you want me to continue on? Or? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. The first years of her childhood, Emma Goldman passed a small idyllic, uh, passed in a small idyllic place in the German Russian province of Kurland when her father had uh, change, had charge of a, a of the government stage. At that time, Kurland was thoroughly German. Even the Russian bureaucracy of the Baltic province was recruited mostly from German Junkers, or maybe it's Junkers, I don't, I don't know. Uh, German fairy tales and stories, rich in miraculous deeds, and the heroic knights of Kurland wove their spell over the, youth, over, her, over the youthful mind. But the beautiful ideal was of short duration. Soon the soul of the government of, of the growing child was overcast by the dark shadows of life already in her tenderest youth the seeds of rebellion and unrelenting hatred of oppression were to be planted in the heart of emma goldman each uh, or, or excuse me early she learned to know the beauty of the state she saw her father harassed by christian uh chinoviks uh, and doubly persecuted as petty official and uh, hated Jew. The brutality of force, conscription, uh, well, excuse me, I think I skipped something there. Uh, the brutality of, of force conscription ever stood before her eyes. She beheld the young men, often sole support of a large family, brutally dragged to the, uh, to the barracks to lead the miserable life of a soldier. She heard the weeping of the poor peasant woman and witnessed the shameful scenes of official venality, uh, which revealed, uh, uh, relieved, excuse me, the rich from military service 
at the expense of the poor. Wow. Uh, she was outraged by this terrible treatment to which female servants were subjected, maltreated and exploited by the barinas, barinas. Uh, they fell to the tender mercies of the regimental office officers who, regular, who regarded them as their natural uh, sexual prey. These girls made preg uh, pregnant by respectable gentlemen and driven out of uh, by their mistresses often found refuge in the Goldman home. And the little girl, her heart palpitating with sympathy, would abstract coins from the parental drawer to clandestinely press the money into the hands of the unfortunate women. Thus Emma Goldman's most striking character, her sympathy with, sympathy with the underdog, already became manifest in her early years. That was a really long paragraph. Um, but yes, like, um, so this, this uh, venality, you know, the relieving the rich from military service, that still happens. Oh, all um, the time. I, I forget what they call it, but like literally if they were to invoke the draft and you can prove that, you know, like you have a good job that, or you're in college significantly more money staying here or if you're in college yeah, yeah then you know like you don't you don't have to go but um the the point is is there's still an option for the rich to get on military service today yeah yeah it's incredible and it's, it's like that uh that bob dylan masters of war song said he talked about how the rich used to just pay people to to serve in their stead you know so if you're poor desperate person on the street and some rich guy comes along and says hey i'll give you so much money if you take my place in the army then you know you don't it, it's it's pretty enticing to them so it, it's but either way it, it's very sickening the way that the, the rich do that and even even when their children do get you know into the army or the armed forces in one way or another they make sure that they are officers or some higher rank where they don't see the front lines ever so it's always the poor that, that fight the wars. Uh, and that, that should really be telling to anyone uh, what these wars are for. It's, it's not really for the benefit of the poor. It's for the benefit of the people that already have money. Uh, most often for the benefit of, of very large businesses to, to uh, push their way into new territory. It's pretty sick. Right. I also wanted to point out that uh, they talk about Emma Goldman's most striking characteristic being her sympathy for the underdog. Yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of like crucial to being a fucking anarchist, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, really. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. Or to really being on the left anywhere, you know, left of a Bernie bro anyway. Because, yeah. well, I mean, we could have a whole conversation about how liberals aren't left, but you get my point. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. As as left as as the current system will allow, basically. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, definitely so. The 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 want for a more uh, egalitarian society. I think that's pretty common to all leftist theory and and practice. That's that's what we all want. Is right. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, she was she was showing this characteristic at a, at a very young age, though, and that's yeah, that's impressive. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I I think. Yeah, I, I wish that that things like empathy and and just learning about other people in the world was was more of a focus in schools. Um, I think that would go a lot way to to push these sorts of feelings. Um, and it, pre it pretty much doesn't matter what what the cause is; you have to care about it. And and no amount of facts or logic or or, or other sort of information is going to force people to care. At some point or other, you have to just start with that that caring feeling. Like, if if I were rich and I didn't care about the environment, it wouldn't matter how many times you know I saw a speech or, or statistics. I would just go go about my life as as I wanted. Um. So yeah, it it it, it all starts with caring. I think that has to be at the the basis of everything. Um, and that's and that's a tough thing because you can't just you can't just throw a bunch of data or a bunch of theory or a bunch of anything at people and just you know naturally that's going to force them to to care about your cause. It takes different 
it takes different tactics. And, and I think empathy is really important too when you're trying to recruit more people into your cause. You have to understand where other people are coming from, what their motivations are, and, and you know how we can both be on the same side of things. Or at least well, you- uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know how much you know about the Black Panther Party, but they were so bit, good yeah. at, at um, understanding, like communicating with the masses, I guess, ultimately, yeah. is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. Um, you know, like, I mean, the people, the people in the community said uh, that their kids needed fucking breakfast, so they started a nationwide <laughs> fucking... It's breakfast for children program which the state ended up doing a free breakfast program at school to undermine the panther party's efforts and that's that's always how it goes i mean that's that's how they undermine the efforts of uh communists when the when the new deal was coming about you know that was that was the uh the bone they tossed to the the lower middle classes to to stave off communism from taking root in the united states um yeah. that was the new deal so that that's always their strategy, but yeah, I mean, it, it it shows just how potent and powerful the Black Panthers were. That that so many of their members were targeted by um, various U.S. intelligent agent intelligence agencies. Um, oh yeah, I mean, there's 16 living Black Panther members or Black Liberation Army members um, that were pretty much all convicted on circumstantial evidence with no yep. witnesses. So yeah. I'm just saying, and and we all know at this point, uh, if you haven't seen Judas and the Black Messiah, go see it. Yeah, uh, but Fred that. Hampton was murdered by the federal government. Uh, Huey yep. Newton was in jail for how long? I mean, the party kept growing anyway, but Huey Newton mm-hmm. was in jail for how long? And they thought that was going to stop the party, and it didn't. Right. So they started just killing people. Yep, yep, yeah. That's that's the system protecting itself, and by any means necessary, apparently. Um. And yeah, that's, it's like, what do you do about that? How do you, how do you prevent your movement from getting so, being a, a victim of its own success, really? Like, um, getting to the point where the government's going to be like, uh, you know, we can't have you guys actually helping out people. We have to come in and, and disrupt you any way we can. Yeah. So that's a constant problem and, and challenge to overcome. Yeah. And, and I mean, it still really is. That's the whole thing. Absolutely. Like, yeah. Um, all these restrictions on social media, which I mean, I know that's not the government, it's private entities, but the government serves the private entities to begin with. So yeah. And the private entities um, try and push the government in their own direction. So, I mean, it's just washes back and forth, you know? Yeah. All the people at the top. So, yeah. Which, I mean, you know, regardless of, of whatever happens in the future, that's what we need to be wary of, mm-hmm. is that, that corruption at the top. I mean, it sure. happens in, in any type of political system. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think, I think that a less bureaucratic, more, more horizontal form of democratic centralism would be great. But, yeah, I mean, you know, what... I don't, I don't know how to, like, put all of that into words, but, I mean, the hor- right. horizontal... Okay, so, like, here's the thing, right? We have we all have computers in our fucking pockets. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why? Well, first of all, why is end-to-end encryption on them not already, like, you know, a thing? But mm-hmm. second, like, if I can put my credit card in this and pay with my fingerprint, why can't we vote like that? I mean, we, we definitely could. I think that's the answer. It's just, and, and I don't mean just like vote every four years for the president. I mean everything sure. that happens, we yeah, all yeah. have a say in. Yeah, that that's that's definitely something that that could be made possible if they really wanted it to. But again, right. there's, there's there's a lot of vested interests in in stopping people from voting and, and actually having any sort of voice. Because you know, if you already have the power. Why do you want anyone else to have it? I guess <laughs> you're right. <laughs> it's the, the unfortunate truth. Um, yeah, I think that's that's an awesome idea, and yeah, I wonder what the possibilities would be just creating independent apps where you could do that sort of thing. Even even just in, from an organizing standpoint, you know, so that right, yeah, involve more people, people that couldn't necessarily make a meeting 
on a regular basis so that at least they'll have a say on, on whatever issues were coming up. That's right. a cool idea. I like that a lot. Which, I, I mean, you know, with, like, the economy being what it is these days and uh, everybody working crazy hours on different shifts. Yeah, for sure. Um, like, I, I mean, I've noticed in my attempts to get involved uh, organizing at the local level that, you know, either I can't make the things that they're scheduling or they can't make the things that we're scheduling, you know, like, I mean, it's hard. It's a struggle. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like even, even just doing Twitch a couple of days a week, that that's about all I have extra time for when, it, you know, when, when I have to factor in like my, you know, spending time with my kids and family and friends, my wife, you know, all these, these different yeah. things that I have to do with my very limited, not working time it's it's hard you know and i have a car i can't even imagine how it would be for someone who who doesn't have a car um or has other mobility issues it's it's got to be an even more tremendous of a struggle so yeah mm -hmm. um at the age of seven back to, i i should have like said i was going back to the book but back to the text <laughs> um to at the yeah. At the age of seven, little Emma was sent to her parents, or sent by her parents, to her grandmother at Konig Konigsberg, the city of Immanuel Kant in eastern Prussia. Save for occasional interruptions, she remained there till her 13th birthday. The first years in these surroundings do not exactly belong to her happiest recollections. The grandmother, indeed, was very amiable, but the numerous aunts of the household were concerned more with the spirit of practical rather than pure reason, and the categoric imperative was applied all too frequently. The situation was changed when, she, when her parents migrated to Konigsberg, and uh, little Emma was relieved from her role of Cinderella. I... I actually like that they worded it that way because I mean, who has, who doesn't know Cinderella? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a good touchstone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, she now regularly attended public school and also enjoyed the advantages of private instruction, customary in middle-class life. Uh, French and music lessons played an important part in the curriculum curriculum. Oh my God. Uh, the future interpreter of Ibsen and Shaw was then a little German Gretchen, uh, quite the home, or quite at home in the German atmosphere. Her special predilections in literature were the sentimental romances of Marlitt. Uh, she was a great admirer of the good Queen Louise, whom the bad Napoleon Bonaparte treated with so marked a lack of knightly chivalry. What might have been her future development had she remained in this milieu? Fate? Or was it economic necessity? Willed it otherwise. Her parents decided to settle in St. Petersburg, the capital of the almighty Tsar, and there to embark in business. It was here that a great change took place in the life of the young dreamer. <clears throat> it was an eventful period, the year of 1882, in which Emma Goldman, then in her 13th year, arrived in St. Petersburg. A struggle for life and death between the autocracy and the Russian intellectuals swept the country. Uh, Alexander II had fallen the previous year. Um, Sofia Perovskaya? I, I, I don't know. Close enough, I, I would guess. I don't know either. I can't pronounce any of those Russian names. <laughs> they're, they're difficult ones, yeah. Yeah. The heroic executors of the death sentence upon the tyrant had then entered the Wahala of immortality. Jesse Helfman, the only regicide whose life the government had reluct reluctantly spared because of pregnancy, followed the unnumbered Russian martyrs to the etapes of Siberia. It was the most heroic period in the great battle of emancipation, a battle for freedom such as the world had never witnessed before. The names of the nihilist martyrs were on all lips, and thousands were enthusiastic to follow their example. The whole intel uh, intelligentsia of Russia was filled with the illegal spirit. Revolutionary sentiments penetrated into every home, from mansion to hovel, impregnating the military, the Ch Chinoviks, Chinovniks, factory workers, and peasants. 
The atmosphere pierced the very casemates of the royal palace. New ideas germinated in the youth. The difference of sex was forgotten. Shoulder to shoulder fought the men and the women, the Russian women. Who shall ever do justice or adequately portray her heroism and self-sacrifice, her loyalty and devo uh, devotion? Holy Tur Turgenev <laughs> calls her in his great prose poem, On the Threshold. Hmm. Yeah, uh, so what that brings up for me, all of that, is... is uh, something that Marx had said, basically, that geography is destiny. And I think that that really it, that really shows that here. It was, it was talking about how, had she stayed in this one place, uh, her life might have gone in an entirely different direction. But because she was in St. Petersburg at a very critical time, it had a huge impact on the way she was, her ideas were, were shaped. So I think it, it, it definitely is important for anarchists like myself to to look at these these ideas of Marx um, the ideas of uh, was it dialectical materialism the idea that your material conditions really shape the way that you you look at the world and and are you know brought into it um, well also in, in that material conditions not ideology drive revolution yeah because absolutely. You know, like under liberalism we have this like great man mentality you know, like George Washington, you know, was the mm -hmm. first president of the United States. Okay, but we don't know the signers of the Declaration of Independence, yeah. which is another thing altogether. The Declaration of Independence, I would argue, was a, a fairly revolutionary document, but the Constitution yeah. is reactionary by comparison. Well, I mean, especially when they didn't even include the Bill of Rights to begin with. It was just the laying out of how the government was going to be formed. So, yeah, you're definitely right on that. Um, yeah. So yeah, but, and, yeah. And also, like liberals time, tend to, and, and when I say liberals in this sense, I, I'm referring mm -hmm. to both liberals and conservatives because they both support the liberal system. Yeah, like neoliberalism, sort of. Right. Yeah. Um. But but the where was I going with that? The, <laughs> the uh, point you, was you were talking about the great man of history and how that's just basically a myth, bullshit. like. Yeah. It's, yeah, and I and I totally agree with that. Especially when you, you look at some of these supposed great men of history, especially people like uh, Elon Musk and and Jeff Bezos and and so on and so forth. And they all have these mythologies that just collect around them, as though it was always meant to be that these super geniuses would rise rise above all their 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 fellow countrymen and and do these wonderful things. But you you peel back the layers just a little bit, and you find it's all it's all just bullshit. It it. You know, Elon Musk family, where uh, they ran a, an apartheid emerald mine. That's how he got his money. Um, yeah. You know, uh, Jeff Bezos. I, I I think he got his money from his parents as well. Same thing with Bill Gates. Like on and same on. Thing Donald Donald Trump, Trump, the small of the the same thing with Donald Trump. Absolutely the same thing. Really. And and the, the run of of like Upper Manhattan to do, to start his real estate empire. Yeah. Um, th these people start with like three aces in their hand and you know they make for themselves a fourth and and we all go oh that's that's such a, a huge accomplishment yeah and and i mean that same mentality goes to our enemies too i mean mm -hmm. we tend to place the blame of all of the mistakes that the ussr made on the shoulder mm -hmm. on the shoulders of joseph stalin mm -hmm. and i i think that frankly that's not fair i'm not saying that he didn't make mistakes but he was one guy. Yeah, he was just one guy. Yep, history is never written just by by one person. That's that's absolutely for sure. Um, and it, it, it all is influenced by the material conditions of the time, too. So. Well, yeah. And, and I mean, that's another thing is that I think, to put this in perspective, I think that after the revolution, Russia needed a, a strong leader. They needed a sar like figure because their culture wasn't ready to not have that yet. And I mean, obviously that needs to go. Fucking Putin is still in that position today. Right. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard to, you know, put yourself in that position and, and say that you would necessarily have done anything different either. Like yeah. from, from the, from the inception of the USSR, uh, uh, the, the so-called Western powers were at their throats. Like, 
wasn't it just like a few years after that that first revolution that that Lenin led that they had already in the, you know the West had already invaded Russia to try and overthrow them? Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, the West armed groups in Russia to that when the when the Russian Civil War was happening, the West armed groups in Russia and uh, in some cases even sent troops in to back them. Yeah, it, it's yeah. it's really just like mind blowing, like. So, we say that communism doesn't work because it always fails, but like, why does it always fail? Well, yeah, I, I, th I think I think we really need to turn that question on its head. If if capitalism is so inevitable uh, to succeed, and communism and and anarchy or whatever leftist theory is so inevitable to fail, then how come every time one of these revolutions or these these movements crops up, the entirety of of capitalist powers has to array themselves to try and smash it by whatever means they can. Why do they have to send in CIA to to, you know, meddle with elections and the integrity of their uh, duly elected officials? Why do we have to literally invade countries? Um, if if it's so yeah. inevitable, why not just let them fail? You know, if that's the way that history has to go, why not just let it go that way? And I think the answer is they know that it's not inevitable. That's just another one of those myths that capitalism likes to throw around that. I mean, I would argue that socialism is more inevitable, or anarchism even. I mean, I granted, I personally think that we're hundreds of years away from yeah, from either, really. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but, yeah. well, and, th and that's another thing. Okay, the USSR didn't accomplish all their goals in 80 years, whatever. Yeah. But, like, did they realize that Lenin and Stalin and all of the members of the Politburo under either of them acknowledge that it was going to be a generations long yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, they themselves were, were under no illusion that um, they were just going to go straight to, to full communist country. Like you, you basically yeah. do have to have global communism for it to work, like to, to get past a, a, a society that has need for money and, and, you know, the state. It, it takes a lot of time and effort and pretty much everyone has to be on the same page. Um, totally agree. Yeah. Even, even a country the size of Russia just doesn't have enough resources to be completely self-sufficient and independent to the rest of the world. It's just not a possibility at this time. You so know, I, I, I know this is getting a little bit off topic, but like <laughs> in terms of Russia, like in terms of the USSR, I should say, mm -hmm. like I was just kind of like looking at the map, yesterday like seeing how big the eastern block was size wise mm -hmm. and it, like i mean socialism was in pretty much all of asia mm -hmm. except for japan taiwan and south korea right and, and uh you know all the way over to halfway through germany i mean sure. like that was that was a massive block mm -hmm. and ultimately that's what made it work but yeah 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 definitely and yeah, it's really amazing that those those few holdouts have, have managed to, to hold on this long. I know places like Cuba, especially being so close to the U.S., it's it's really remarkable they've managed to keep you know some semblance of the revolution intact. Yeah, well, and I mean they're they're adapting as well. Like I mean well, they've had to. I'm yeah. not saying they haven't made missteps, but I think that they're sure. actually trying to listen to the people. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to do whatever they can to come out of this without giving up on socialism. Right. Yeah. And that's what pisses the U S off. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. It was, uh, and it, and, and again, it was those same reactionary people as, as soon as there was even a whiff of protest in, in Cuba that they were like, Oh, there's, there's protest in Cuba. That means socialism has to fall. And like, like all this stuff, like, do you not remember like exactly a year ago when we had the largest protest movement in the world in history in in all the capitalist countries like if if anything is is a, a sign that that a system has to go shouldn't ha it have been that <laughs> yeah <laughs> not yeah. not a not a few thousand cubans saying hey this is really difficult with these these uh restrictions right. from covid yeah. Yeah, well, and I mean, that's that's not even what it was. It was more or less about uh, power outages because they don't have enough oil to power the entire uh, island at once when the hospitals are at capacity and they're opening up 
other right. buildings as hospitals. Right. So, I, I mean, like, I can yeah, understand right. why they'd be upset. And, I, I mean, they've already been having food supply issues for, mm-hmm. well, off and on since the fall of the USSR. I sure. mean, the, the period that Cuba finds itself in now is just as difficult as the, the quote, special period in the 90s when the USSR fell. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Except, for, except for now, finally, Mexico and China have started sending supplies to Cuba. That's great. And I think that's going to turn the whole thing around, honestly. Yeah. Cause, uh, and, and again, you know it's it's the the western powers meddling in in cuba's ability to function on the on the world in the world market you know uh the the biggest cause of all of these shortages is the u.s embargo on on so many goods that that otherwise would be freely going to to cuba so yeah. fair I know we didn't get that far on this book tonight, but um, that's okay because this was kind of just a spur of the moment thing anyway. Sure. Um, but that being said, it is five o'clock and I'm supposed, well, five o'clock my time. <laughs> and I'm supposed to be starting a stream in one minute and you're supposed to be starting yep. a stream in one minute. So we should probably. Uh, wrap this up we uh you can visit our website at forwearemany.org we do have some of zach's work up on the website and that will be growing in the future awesome um, thank you and zach you should plug yourself like if you got a website or yeah uh basically the, the the best way to find my stuff uh no matter what platform you're, you're looking for is to go to l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash bread underscore theory that's that's my link tree you can find links to my facebook my twitch my youtube and then all the different social media platforms that i'm on and and that's just the the best way to do that so l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash bread underscore theory and thanks so much for having me on tonight this, is, this has been a lot of fun yeah um you know, next time I think we'll probably be a little more organized about it, but yeah, yeah. and uh, I hope Trish, Trish can uh, join us better. I hope she gets a clear connection next time. Yeah, well, for tonight's stream, we're gonna go back to Zoom because we didn't seem to have any issues with that, uh, yeah. which is weird because the times that we've used restream directly in the past, we yeah. haven't had any of those issues. Yeah. Like yeah. usually, it's Zoom that's thrown her out to the ether, but yeah, yeah, well, today. Technology. <laughs> I know, right? There's always <laughs> got to be something. Yep. All oh, right. Man. Um, but yeah, um, that's that's all I got, I suppose. Uh, see you guys on our channel in a couple minutes for the current event stream. Yep. And, I, and I'll be streaming on, on my channel, which is uh, bread underscore theory on Twitch in, in just a couple of minutes as well. We're going to start State and Revolution. So that should be a lot of fun. It should. It should. All right.